Welcome, welcome back, back to iSpooge. Today's March 24th, 2022. And, uh, so I'm just gonna do another video that expands on being stalked or gang, gang stalking. Um, three of my most recent videos are things that could potentially fit into this category. Not the most recent, but like three of the last 10 or so. One was a guy who had been harassing me for like a year when I was staying in my car. Another is uh, some guys who showed up at the restaurant I was eating at and like played music, left their engines running and smoked cigarettes right outside the patio. And the third one was this like exercise group of people came and like all were working out right around my car that was parked on an empty stretch of the street in the park early one morning and it's like you couldn't have like stopped 50 feet sooner or gone 50 feet further it's like a group of people and they were all just like exercising right around my car and you know i was like okay so i'm breathing in all this you know exhale of these people and it was during pandemic and I'm like um okay tone deaf or you know they're purposely doing it you never really know but uh so it's like benign interactions can happen like some guy came up to me didn't really look poor but he asked me for money I'm like you know and at the end, he has, he has to shake my hand. And, uh, you know, I like, okay. He like made a big deal about shaking hands. And then later at a coffee shop, another one, cause I went to two, um, guy came up, sat next to me, sat there for a while. I noticed it looked like his phone camera was on me but I didn't, you know, say anything or whatever. And then he asked me about my car pewter and, you know, talked to him a little bit. And he's like not really wanting to continue the conversation, but also he's just like sitting there drinking an espresso. So I was like, okay, seems like an educated guy, whatever. I'll take the initiative and be a little proactive in keeping the conversation going. So I kind of did. But then it's just like, you know, while we were talking, he kind of had his, his phone in his hand and it's like, you know, the back facing camera was still kind of pointed towards me. And, you know, it's just like, okay, am I being paranoid, right? But it's just like, the thing is, okay, so back to the narcissistic abuse or cluster B personality, like they have, a secret language that they develop with you in a sense like like they keep doing things that they know bother you just by your reaction but they'd be no big deal in isolation so so anyway it's like it's possible that both of these interactions were benign and then well also with the first one at the same time uh, a delivery van for a particular company that I always see like you know, it used to be the Waymos that I always saw, and now it's always these vans that I always see. But it's not like always, it's just like at key points, like when the probability of seeing them is so low. And it's like, anyway, probably just being paranoid, right? So anyway, without asserting that anything is going on it's just like that's the sort of mindset you start having when you're experiencing you know it's like when you live with a cluster b person like if they're a covert narcissist and you tell family members about their behavior they're like oh it's just because they care oh it's just you know they just like excuse it for whatever reason and a lot of times the reason will have to do with power dynamics, like they'll have a relationship with that family member. And if they were to believe your allegations of abuse, then that relationship with the family member would have to change. They might personally have to do something. 
you know, maybe they're getting some benefit from that relationship that they don't want to disappear. So it's like, there's incentive to not believe the, you know, abuse victim. And, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of how it would be with gang stalking too. It's like the behavior of the cluster B is that of a reprobate or a demon possessed person, a archon, jinn, etc., possessed person. And that behavior is an exact match of what AI developed with dark intent might be. It's possible that AI could be developed with light intent too, but um, like, you know, just cold calculating algorithmic, like that's how, that's how a demon would think. Like, because they're not creative on their own, they can take things, they can switch it around, invert it, they can deceive, you know, get away with things when they know they can get away with things. Um, you know, maximizing for certain metrics, um, stuff like that. So, oh, kind of all over the place, feeling a little crazy, but these are always like the one take, no fake things. And yeah, one of the reasons I used to do these blogs is because I'm like pretty isolated, don't have a lot of people to talk to, hence kind of like oversharing, not really oversharing, but just being like friendly with strangers and not being too reserved with them, I should say. Like, given given my circumstances, I should be a lot more reserved um, from talking to random strangers in public. But like, for my whole life, I've always been like pretty, pretty, you know, trusting, acting in good faith. People have generally liked to listen to what I have to say. You know, I always ask them about something, you know, to kind of bring the conversation back to them as well. Like they might open up, you know, they might come to me and ask me questions about something and I'll go on for it a little bit, but then I'll turn it and then start asking them stuff about themselves and like finding common ground. So like there's certain, if you're a vulnerable person, like in Minnesota, for example, there's vulnerable adult status, MN690.232. And it's actually like, it's a felony to mess with these people in certain ways, like financial exploitation, various types of abuse. And if you're dealing with services in that state, you actually have to have uh, an anti-abuse plan. So it may be like audio recording all your interactions, etc. like because you're vulnerable. You're basically a teenager, like pre-18, who can't legally go out and do stuff, or for some reason you physically can't go out and do stuff. Like, There's like four criteria that determine whether you're vulnerable, and one of them is a physical or mental infirmity. So one could say that a homeless person has a physical infirmity and that like especially during shower uh, pandemic where gyms were shut down and the showers were closed, they weren't able to adequately clean themselves. You know, shelters are full. Um, health club or gym showers are closed. So they physically cannot take a shower. And so that's basically a physical infirmity. You know, it's not a broken arm, but it's, you know, a broken ability to take an interview. It's not because of a mental infirmity, like they mentally can't do the interview. I mean, you'd almost be mentally ill if you could just go to an interview completely dirty, greasy, disgusting, non-hygienic during a pandemic. You'd almost have to be mentally ill to go to an interview and pretend that nothing's wrong if you can't take a shower, you know what I mean? So like, if you can't take a shower, you basically have a physical infirmity. Um, and, you know, I don't think anyone would say, oh, you're mentally ill because you went to an interview in that scenario. But at the same time, the person who you're interviewing with wouldn't really want to shake your hand, stuff like that. So, like, they might do it, but they might not feel good about it. And then how's that going to reflect on the hiring decision? Oh, well, legally it can't, you know. Well, everyone who's been on the hiring side knows that there's non-illegal ways of rationalizing things. So... Anyway, so
So yeah, like for this one, it's still not scripted, one take, no fake, but I wrote down some notes. Just like, so something that I do when I, when I get a weird feeling is I think about um, what this recruiter told me once was like, what's the worst possible interpretation of the situation? Like think, you know, consider that like a cluster B who is trying to like get you would be thinking in the worst possible interpretation of things. And so that's like a useful tool for me to think like, okay, assuming, assuming this is stalking behavior, like what's the worst possible interpretation of what's going on? So then I, I boil it down to like an abstract strategy and I'm thinking something like 48 laws of power. So it's like, so I wrote down after that, inter that last interaction strategy, have a stranger interrogate opponent who may file for damages. So this would be like a law firm hiring an investigator to discredit their opponent who might be trying to get damages from them. So use the fact that people sugarcoat things to strangers to create contradictions in testimony and trip them up or undermine their credibility. E.g. you would cover for abuse and give a positive spin on, I wrote homelessness, but you know, I just like scratch out these notes quick sometimes. And so like what that would mean is like if you're homeless, you're being abused by somebody and somebody comes up and talks to you in a coffee shop, are you gonna just go straight into the, the truth of, of what's going on with you? Or are you gonna kind of like, you know, focus on other things? You know, if they notice that, you know, you have broken out skin, like, like I noticed this after I had lunch when I looked in the mirror that my skin is actually pretty broken out and it's because like, you know, I don't know exactly why it is, but like my diet has changed. I've been under a lot of stress. So, you know, if I reference the fact that my skin is broken out, I might pick one of those two explanations. Like, and it would probably be like the sort of positive one where it's like, yeah, I've been eating a lot more pizza lately because I'm vegan, but I finally found one uh, that doesn't have cheese that actually uses a lot of tomatoes instead, the farmer's pie, as opposed to the pizza, right? As opposed to, yeah, I'm under a lot of stress because I'm living with a cluster B person who, you know, this and that. So, but anyway, so like, so then I wrote, get them to record it and play it back directly and humiliate the one giving testimony. So it's like you give a testimony about, you know, how, how this has led you to have to stay with the cluster B person and it's like stressed you out. But then they're like, well, we had our investigator go and have a conversation with him. And he said it was because he was eating a lot of bread. So even though those can both be true, it sort of undermines the credibility of the person by showing that, oh yeah, they might, they might sugarcoat things. And then they might extend it to say, oh, well, you know, how about when you interviewed with the company, did you sugarcoat anything then? because it's like now established that you sugarcoat things when you talk. And so, so basically I said, show how good of a liar they are in quotes. Uh, if they mention sugarcoating to stranger. So it's like, well, yeah, it is true that I live with a cluster B person out of necessity and it's been extremely stressful. But, you know, when you talk to a stranger, you sort of sugarcoat things or, you know, give a positive spin on it because, you know, you're you're not trying to, like, send them running. And then it's like, well, you know, I basically wrote what I just said here, which was escalated to sugarcoating uh, things in job interviews. And then I just wrote like, okay, well, why do people sugarcoat? You know, there's various reasons and sugarcoating might, you know, there might be other related things that people do to sort of like, give the perception is greater than reality thing, which by the way, I did find that book that I mentioned yesterday. Um, so, you know, it's like the point would be, you know, you tell one story to some people and another story to some people in this situation. So, you know, what's to say you don't do it, you know, in, in another situation. And then it's like, the thing is with like, I mean, it's like the TV stereotype that lawyers will 
will like rip apart your life and do whatever. Like they don't care about screwing up all your relationships and this and that because it's defending their client. So it's like basically God protects the righteous. No weapon formed against the righteous shall prosper is the only way you can think about it. Otherwise you're going to be like super paranoid. Like one of the things that, um, and so I wrote another list of stuff on the whiteboard to kind of like go into like a like specific situation of like, oh, why might I, you know, be feeling like this paranoid and this and that. Um, so like the complaint against me, it was like 250 pages and it like talked about all this stuff. And like one of the bosses was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm so scared for my life. I have to change my routes at work. And so it's like basically like the law firm who's representing the client, like they actually have some perverse incentive to like, you know, instead of saying like, you know, why, why don't you talk it out or have you tried to talk it out? Like it may be that, cause like I said yesterday, like not, ev not, not everyone wants to talk things out and you can't force people to talk things out. But like, if you get a law firm involved, whose job it is to, I mean, their job is to bill as many hours as possible. So that's their incentive because more hours, more money. Like, and if they, if they can lie without getting caught while billing a lot, then, you know, who knows? Or it may just be a rogue lawyer within the company who wants to get a bonus. Like maybe there's perverse incentives for, you know, billing certain amounts of time or money um, coming in at, you know, through, through different cases or clients or whatever. So like the lawyers have every incentive to actually create fear in the client. They could even, they could even hire an investigator to, to stalk the client in a sense and actually give them uneasy feelings actually. Cause like you ever get that feeling what we're like, you know, you're being watched. Like, I think that's a real thing. Like, I think, like, thoughts are are sort of like, well, how, what, what are you basing that on, right? Like, assume for a second that DNA, it's unique to the person, and it's actually kind of like a radio transmitter and receiver, and... Like you're in an environment and it's all created within your brain. And so assume you're sitting here and like, you don't know, like even thinking the zombie problem, you don't even know that the person next to you is conscious, much less how they're interpreting the situation. So it's like, you know, you're seeing a situation and like somewhere in that situation, someone else is there watching the situation and like, you know, it may be like, picture this, like you're looking out at a bunny and an eagle somewhere who's look, flying around looking for bunnies may not see the bunny because it's like hidden under some brush, but they see a person or two looking and pointing at something under the brush. And so, you know, eagle eye might see, oh, those people are looking at something. And a lot of times when people are looking at something, it's food for me. So why don't I swoop over here? Oh, there, there is a bunny under there, you know? So it's like the eagle can't see the bunny, but something in the environment makes it aware that the bunny's there. So, you know, it could even be like the law firm is like, okay, all we have to do is make this guy feel extremely uneasy by actually sending somebody to watch him. And it may be that like people in the environment notice that he's being watched or, you know, maybe he has his own security team that notices somebody watching him. And then boom, it's like, oh, I'm scared for my life that uh, some that someone's going to stalk me. So I have to like change my routes at work. And, you know, it happens to be this guy that I'm scared of. So it's like, boom, the lawyer spends, you know, two hundred dollars on an investigator to make the client feel uneasy. And then because of that, they get $200,000 of legal work 
you know, filing a complaint, doing all the hearings, filing 250 pages of evidence against this, you know, alleged scumbag. So did that happen? Who knows? But it's like, in the end, all secrets will be revealed and no weapon formed against the righteous shall prosper. So it's like, that's that sort of faith thing that, you know, the same thing I mentioned when you're having, you know, benign interactions with people. Like, you can't just, like, act like a paranoid freak and, you know, never have an interaction with somebody because you don't trust them because they might be, you know, setting you up to humiliate you or, you know, undermine you or something like that. Because you know that you're always telling the truth. You're always being genuine. And as soon as you actually start being paranoid, stop having genuine interactions with people, then you're actually being fake. And then, you know, people who are observing you, if you're like a regular at places, they're actually observing that, oh, now you are kind of the weird one, you know? So... So yeah, it's like, I went into maybe a little bit, a little bit of, of detail there, but it's like, and that, those aren't the only ones who might be stalking me. That's just like one example. Like when you're homeless, you know, people might notice that, but they might not care because homeless people don't have a lot. But then if they like find out about your GitHub, you find out that you have a wealth of intellectual property, um, then they might, you know, try to, try to get that out of you somehow. Um, you know, if it's if if they find out that you've worked for a lot of famous companies, they might want clout. They might find out that you have uh, accusations of violence on on your record, and so they might play off of that to create the perception and and make some claim that oh, you know, they they tried to assault me, and then. Yeah, like this has even kind of happened at a at a workplace where someone made the claim that, you know, they like kept approaching me throughout the day and then I misspoke when I said something and they're like, I'm telling the manager. And I like, I bolted straight to the manager. I said like, you know, this person, like, I don't know what their deal is, but they just, I misspoke and then they said that they were going to make a claim against me. And like, this is actually a really serious claim. And like just earlier, you know, previously she was talking about like a bounty hunter or something too. So I'm like, oh crap, that's kind of like what gave me the idea that like maybe the bounty hunter is connected with this law firm and the bounty is sort of like, cause like, you know, demons have to tell you what they're doing. So I'm like, is she like fulfilling a bounty by, you know, making a claim against me? You know, this was like, this was while I was homeless and these people were super poor, or possibly homeless or underhoused as well. So like they would do anything for a few hundred bucks. I mean, assuming, and th that's not most of the people, most of the people were good people, but this particular one, you know, usually the seedy people are out of there quick. You know, God protects the righteous. Most of the people at this place were righteous. Um. So yeah, and it's like, Another one too might be like if you have non-disclosure agreements with people, they might be worried that that you're going to disclose it because you're disgruntled or something, um, or you know do it for money or you know whatever the case may be. It may be totally irrational, but like the thing is, it's just all you know. No weapon against the righteous shall prosper. That's why you just have to stay righteous, like no matter how poor and run down and whatnot you are, you have to just stay righteous. Because otherwise, like, because if you do, and this this is like a new idea to me, this is not, like, because for a while I stopped answering my phone, I stopped, you know, I stopped DMing with people online, which I, I'm still in that habit of not doing it. So it's like, you know, at first, like my voicemail box started filling up and it was like a bunch of unknown numbers too, but I didn't know that God protects the righteous. I just, I was still kind of in fear of, you know, you know, I was never like an atheist, but also I didn't really know 
karma that much. Like I, I studied and practiced Soto Zen Buddhism, but that's like, you know, trust no teacher. And like, all you really do is just like sit at the wall and meditate. So when I say there's like huge truth in that, there definitely is. So yeah, I mean like, so I'm still acting as though weapons can prosper against me. So like, it's not so much that I'm in fear anymore, but it's like, maybe I was in fear for a long time, even if it was irrational fear. Cause you know, it's like you see movies and these things work and something I've talked about before is like justice and like something that like all movies get wrong is the sense of justice. Like, like these random things have these random bad things happen to good people. Like, but you're not seeing the whole story. Like at the end of the movie, antitrust, one of the guys, um, who, who doesn't go work for the corporation, but like keeps working open source, like some guys go in, beat them down, you know, that they, they were surveilling them for a while. They beat them down and took his stuff. And so it's like, that's not a just thing that wouldn't happen in real life unless for some reason God allowed this guy to get beat down. So there would have been something that he had done or some attitude that he held or something that would have allowed that to happen. Like for all we know, he, he was doing bad things to his cousin, his little, you know, his little kid cousin or something. And because of that, you know, God was not with him. And so he got beat down. So it's like there's something in the movie that you don't see that would have allowed that to happen. So a lot of movies, you know, where bad things happen to good people, it's like you don't see if something bad happens, that person deserved it. And, you know, that's, oh, boo-hoo, oh, he seemed like, but you don't know the person from the movie. So, so yeah, once you step into the faith of knowing that bad things don't happen to good people, then you actually have incentive to be a good person because if you're a bad person, uh, and a big misconception of the Bible too is that there's only one God. No, there's creator God and there's God of this world, Lucifer at the top of the pyramid. And maybe he's got some sub gods or whatever below him. But, uh, you know, God could do away with that whole pyramid in a second if he wanted to. But the thing is, it actually helps people learn lessons by bad things happening to them when they do bad. Like, Lucifer is also God's creation. The whole Satan, the whole adversary, the whole system below Lucifer is God's creation still, and it's part of God's creation. And so... No weapon formed against the righteous shall prosper. So weapons can form. These could be real setups against me. These could be real attempts to undermine me. Should I choose to go seek damages from these people? But at the end of the day, justice will work because it is a just universe. As much as movies want us to believe that it isn't because while well, the, what do they say? The greatest lie, the devil ever told or the greatest trick he ever played was to convince people that he didn't exist. Like the devil isn't this big scary horn guy. It's just, it's just, well, you know, I'm, I'm using devil and Satan interchangeably. Like Satan is the system that punishes the wicked. And that is part of God's creation to punish the wicked. Well, why does God let people be wicked then? Because we have free will, we can be wicked. Before the fall, we were all good, and there was no evil to balance it out. Like, there just was. And so when we decided to, well, how is eating an apple wicked? I don't get, you know, how is learning things wicked? I don't get, it's, you know, it's because of the consequences of using these technologies. Like, assuming the whole, like, New Age thing is fully true, which, like, it's like a half truth because we are all we are all gods. We are we can 
manifest our reality. It's just like in the process of manifesting things, you know, if we manifest that we have, you know, a huge oil field, well, there is consequences to owning a huge oil field for other people. And so even though you're like completely peaceful, whatever, like the consequences, it's like in economics, there's externalities. And so part of your missing the mark, committing sin and having this oil field is, and you know, last thing I need to do is get a, a, a target painted on my back from the oil industry. But you know, it's like whatever these emissions have, have impact on people. Like if there's free energy, then there's not. But then if there's free energy, we don't need to drill for, for oil either. But anyway, like, you know, there's, there's like second and third order effects that happen when you have, you know, your dream car, your dream industry, your dream this, your dream that. And like it may be, you know, completely ethical or whatever within your business, but at some level there's like external costs that affect other people. So, and your second order effects, you know, basically you have to pay for those. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The, the law of conservation of energy, like you create a negative energy in the world, a negative energy is coming back at you. You know, as you know, as as big of a diagram and improbable as it may be, it's like God protects the righteous, and I kind of broke this and went off on into a tangent. But like, yeah, God God allows the punishment of the wicked, as opposed to God doing the punishment. You know, God of this world, Lucifer is responsible for the punishment. God of the universe simply withdraws his protection from this person who deserves to be punished. Some may say, oh, that's just a technicality. So you mean if someone was choking on the ground and they don't have God's protection, then God would let them choke to death. But if they do have God's protection, then someone would happen by and give them CPR. Exactly. So, yeah, like the thing is about being stalked, you only have to be afraid if you're actually, if you've actually put negative ener energy into the world that can come back to you. So do I have to be afraid of being stalked? I mean, there's a period of life, like while you still have grace, while you're still doing bad things, but from my end, from my thinking, like on the day of judgment, you get judged and you repent from everything or you have showed repentance, you know, a, a lifetime of repentance from things as you realize that you did them wrong. And then once you're judged, the whole record is forgiven. And like, it's the same thing too, like, I used to refuse to write down all of this stocking stuff, like, because on one hand, I thought if I give it attention, it'll manifest more into the world, so I don't even want to give it attention. And for two, I th there's, I don't remember what verse it is, but I studied it again and decided, you know, in the, sp like, the spirit of things is, you're not supposed to keep an account against somebody. But I think after, I think it that means against somebody who's willing to, you know, come together and, and make it right. Because, for example, like there are, you're not supposed to take people to court, but if they refuse the Christian way of solving things, then you can take them to court. Like first you go to them alone, you talk to them. And if they refuse, then you bring in 
you know, somebody else to kind of mediate with you. And if they refuse that, then that's what the courts are for. So if you go through all those steps, then you might have to take somebody to court. And if you take somebody to court, you need evidence. But then once things are settled, boom, you can get rid of, you can get rid of the account because that's what court literally is. It is settling accounts. Think monetary accounts are settled, made zero. So I see God's judgment as the exact same thing. He keeps a record until you've settled. You know, he's given you judgment. Now you're settled. And now it's zero. It's clear. Because there's something that says like, you know, once, once you've been judged, it's as if you never did the sin. And so it's like the same thing, like, once you've gone to court, it's as though there was never a balance. I mean, technically people might still keep a score and hold a grudge, but realistically what you should do is just get rid of the fact that there was ever a balance. It's kind of funny, a balance in the account. An imbalance that created the need to get justice and come to balance. As you, you know, to zero balance it. Don't want to get lost on that detail. But, um, yeah, so it's like, if you're being stalked and you're not wicked, then you probably don't have anything to worry about. You know, it, it might still be causing you time. And, well, if the person doing it is a cluster B, then that means they're demon infested and... Like, you can pray for them to be delivered from whatever is causing them to do this, and in which case, they repent, they stop and change direction, and then, you know. An idea that I like is um, on IRC, when you would ban someone, a G-line, a global ban, there was actually an expiration date on it. And so I like the Jubilee period of seven years. Like, whenever I block somebody, which it's extremely rare. I hate blocking people. But now that I know that cluster bees are like literally demon infested, there's an expiration date, jubilee period, seven years. So if they come back and make trouble after seven years, just block them again for seven more years. So if they've stopped stalking you and repented, maybe you remember for the seven years, but then after the seven years, you get rid of the records. So... And I'm a big fan of that as a general data retention as well. Because, like, I don't know if it's 100% correct that all the atoms in your body replace themselves after seven years. And I haven't studied the Jubilee period of seven years too closely. But, like, personally, if I have any debts... Well, first of all, you should give gifts as opposed to lend things to people anyway. But if for some reason you have a debt that's six, uh, seven years old, just forgive it. I mean, that's... I had some really old debts from friends who I should have just given gifts to. I could have just given gifts, but they never paid. And I never, like, tried to collect it. And so I'm just like, you know, forgiven. Like, why, why push that? So how does that wrap around to being stocked? I mean, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent. One take, no fake. Um, but yeah. So it's like, there's no need to be paranoid if you're being stocked. And I know I'm repeating this, you know, and you're righteous. Um, and if you do need to seek legal remedy, I mean, like, Ideally, you know, probably if you're being stalked, you've you've talked to this person and said, don't talk to me, don't, you know, don't contact me anymore, and then they do. Now in today's world, it's like the nuclear family is dead, communities are dead. Like, not everywhere, but, you know, my perspective as someone who grew up in the city and mostly lives in cities is that finding finding a neutral intermediary is pretty much not something that you can do. So it's like, that's definitely an opportunity for growth in our legal system. 
is like mediation. You know, some, some companies do like arbitration, but like, I'm not as familiar with that. I just know that some companies do it. I still don't think it's the same because it's still like a paid service as opposed to, oh man, we could go off on the tangent of like friends are people with shared investment. Friends are people who do business together. Like like two neighbors, they have incentive to keep their property value high. Like if one person in the neighborhood has a super junky house, they're bringing down the property value of everyone in the area. They may be making other people in the area care less, which then further brings it down for everybody. So like, like the neighbors, if a neighbor has a problem, like say they want to move and they want to get more money when they move, like they want to say to the person with the junky house, like, Hey, you know, your junky house is bringing down my property value. Like I should be getting $200,000 more, you know, based on other, this or that factors. But like, because of your junky house, you know, it's like kind of hard to sell here. So I've got to like sell it for a lot less. And so, you know, there's $200,000 of incentive to solve that problem. So, you know, like what can you do? You know, you get, you get, well, another neighbor isn't necessarily impartial. Like they're gonna be inclined to agree with the person because they want more property value too. So you might have to get someone from like a nearby neighborhood who's like far enough away that the junkie house isn't really impacting them, but close enough that they still go to the same farmer's market, you know, like shared investment isn't just like, like, you know, stock in a company. It's like, it could be your neighborhood. And then it's like, almost like the federal system, like the closer to local you are, the more shared investment you have. Like people in a shared house might have like 95% common investment. But like working online almost makes it so you're working with people who have like, you know, 5% shared investment as opposed to working with people from your neighborhood to like go do logging that's, you know, at the edge of the town. You know, you've got say like 80% overlap in doing this sustainably if everyone who works there works within the community. So, so yeah, that's kind of like just to establish like what, what a impartial third party is. It's like they're far enough away that they're not involved, but they're close enough that they're still um, shared values, like people from a coal town might not have the same values as a person from a logging town. Um, and so if you get an impartial judge from a coal town, you know, they might agree one way or another, but they're not, they don't have enough, they don't have much of a shared investment in either party. So it's like, it's got to be from somewhere close enough that they understand the lifestyles and everything of both people. Like they can actually make a sound judgment that both people will think is fair when it comes down. But they've got to be far enough away that like, they're not invested in the outcome either way. So, you know, that's like step two in problem resolution. It's like step one, you privately speak about it. Step two, you have an impartial third party come and hear both sides and act like act as a judge in the spirit and that should be able to resolve it. And the third step would actually be going to the court system, which, you know, that's a whole can of worms about whether it's actually impartial. Um, I, there is, there is biblical basis for the right spirits acting in those situations. Like, even though, you know, the punishment system is part, you know, including like the Illuminati, including, you know, people who might try to corrupt judges, this and that, like, like things would work out so that, you know, if you're a just and righteous person, legitimately, like not just your story says so, like a movie, like legitimately, you know, the right spirits 
should align themselves so you end up with a non-corrupt judge. So, you know, maybe like things are stacked, like they've formed a weapon knowing that when you go to court, they're going to have a judge who's in their brodo's back pocket. I say that as like a, um, just mocking people who are in fraternities because they actually have to take oaths of secrecy. You know, if you disclose the secrets, you'll die or whatever. Um, so they may, like, they're just part of the demonic kingdom and God decides if they prosper or not. So their plan, their heady plan, might be set up to, like, stack a judge against a righteous person. But if it's truly a righteous person, their plan will crumble. Like, the weapon can form, but it won't prosper. You know, just like a stalker. A stalker can stalk, but whatever they're planning to do will not prosper. So, yeah. Hopefully that was a little bit more focused than yesterday's talk, but yeah, that's just kind of like the justice of being stalked and having faith in God protecting you if you're actually righteous and basically the incentive to actually be righteous. Um, I didn't say when nobody's looking, but obviously like God sees everything. So God's always looking. So the devil's greatest trick is convincing people that he doesn't exist and thus by extension God doesn't exist and uh, you know you can get away with things no you can't so yeah if you're being stalked and you're righteous and you're being stalked by you know a law firm who's got incentive to try to screw you over in any way they can and even if they've actually like showed up at your workplaces before, even if they've actually lied to the court before, none of this will prosper in the end, you know. So you got to just remain yourself and without fear, um, even if you've been, you know, you can't have shame from having had fear in the past either. Because it's like you speak in the affirmative today, but you know that you've acted out of fear in the past. Well, You've had it revealed to you that you are righteous and no weapon against you shall prosper. So yeah, be good to each other as well as yourself and toodaloo.